Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar where we'll be taking an introductory look at biomass applications. My name is Stephen Kennett and I look after the Energy and Built Environment groups here at Two Degrees. I'm delighted to welcome our presenters today. Joining us we have Sam Watmore, Director of Forest Fuels, Mark Summers, Head of the Low Carbon Programme for the Royal Cornwall Hospitals Trust, and Stephen Carter, Energy and Environment Technical Officer at Cornwall Healthcare Estates and Support Services all of whom have a wealth of experience in this area. Today's presentations will last for around 45 minutes, which will lead us with 10 minutes for questions at the end. Before we begin, I'd just like to remind everyone that you can submit questions throughout the webinar using the Q&A box on the bottom right-hand side of the screen. Just type in your question and press send, and we'll answer as many as we can at the end. Also, if you should have any technical issues during the presentation, please use the chat box on the right-hand side to send me a message, and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. So without any further delay, I'd like to hand over to Sam, who will get us started with today's presentation. Over to you, Sam. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Sam Watmore. I'm uh, the um, founder and, and director of a company called Forest Fuels Limited. Um, I, my background in history is that uh, originally I was a forester, but became... Um, uh, involved and interested in biomass in about the year 2000, um, traveled quite extensively overseas really to countries in Europe or, or indeed North America where um, wood fuel supply for energy uh, was a very substantial and very well-developed business. Um, and whilst there were many people starting to import boilers uh, in the early part of last decade, there were very few people understanding the infrastructure of fuel storage and handling. And obviously, uh, you can't have one without the other, and the two go, go very much hand in hand. Um, so, uh, and then I went on to install my own boiler in 2003. So I've had a, a chip boiler at my farm, heating holiday cottages and offices um, for 10 years now, which is running very well. It's been a very good learning experience to um, uh, walk the walk as well as talking the talk. Um, and in 2006, I set up Forest Fuels, really uh, seeing that there was an emerging uh, market for uh, uh, fuel supply uh, across the UK. Um, primarily, the company started in the southwest, uh, and we've then uh, grown from that uh, as the company's grown in scale. Uh, but I'll come back to a, a little bit about forest fuels later. Um, to talk through uh, what I'm um, going to go through today, um, first of all, uh, really I'm just going to uh, explore some uh, hows and whys and wheres uh, in relation to biomass heating. Um, so the first question really to ask is uh, who might install biomass and, and for who might it be the right uh, type of energy form? Um, and I think really the obvious um, answer to that is, is anyone consuming a large amount of heat? Um, and um, initially, one thinks of residential properties as not particularly large heat consumers. Um, but then you remember that about 40 to 45 percent of the UK's energy bill, so about eight billion pounds a year, uh, is spent on heat only. Uh, it's not on electricity or transport fuels. It's simply on providing heat, and that might be anywhere from uh, industrial heat, uh, agricultural heat, um, processing of materials or, or food products um, through to uh, the hot water for a hospital or a prison uh, or a military base or uh, residential in a university uh, or a, a large stately home or, or large uh, hotel in a, in a stately home. So the slide I'm just putting up at the moment is uh, really shows you a, a number of examples there. Um, poultry farmers, very big users of uh, LPG to generate heat for uh, young chickens in the early stage of that process. Um, at the bottom there is a, a large, uh, that's actually a large public school, uh, Culford School in in, um, uh, in East Anglia, uh, where there's now a very large um, substantial heat main, about two and a half kilometres of heat main, supplying, supplying heat to residential buildings, swimming pools, classroom blocks across the school site. And then further up, you see a swimming pool, hospital, uh, maybe a prison, and then Dairy Crest at the top have a very large uh, pellet-fired uh, boiler to generate heat for their dairy business. And the important thing to remember is really that um, whilst the gas grid may be extensive in certain parts of the UK, and depending on where you're uh, listening to this webinar from, uh, you may think, well, um, oil and LPG aren't significant. But there are very large tracts of the country, and certainly the southwest is uh, a case in point, where the gas grid is extremely poor, 
uh, and people are using LPG and oil to generate heat. Uh, and, uh, and with oil and LPG, they may be paying anywhere from six and a half, seven pence a kilowatt hour up to 10 pence a kilowatt hour, uh, whereas currently mains gas um, may be as low as two to three uh, pence a kilowatt hour. So it's really uh, heat users. Um, and one way to, uh, to increase that is to amalgamate heat loads. So the other way to make biomass pay is to uh, connect a large number of buildings up through a heat main so that although each individual building uh, under either under the same ownership or separate ownership uh, may not have a significant heat load, by connecting them to one central boiler plant through a heat main, you can achieve a, a significant heat load to be replaced by biomass. And, and obviously, so I'm talking there about, about oil and LPG um, across the UK as being uh, significant targets for biomass. And why would you do it? Well, uh, cost is a fundamental one, obviously. As I said, um, oil and LPG prices, um, 6 to 10 pence a kilowatt hour. Uh, wood fuel might come in at uh, as low as 3 pence a kilowatt hour on very large industrial sites, up to probably 5, 5.5, maybe 6 pence a kilowatt hour. Um, and whilst that, uh, at the top end of that price range, may only be marginally competitive with oil, uh, you have to bear in mind that there is now uh, a government incentive scheme which makes it extremely competitive with oil. So moving on, other benefits, obviously, uh, carbon emissions reduction, uh, and there may be a, a soft or a hard benefit there. Uh, the soft benefit is clearly that uh, we will have to do our part for reducing carbon emissions, and that may be mandatory. Uh, or statutory, so there are um, certain government organizations either centrally controlled like the NHS, uh, MOD, National Prison Service, uh, where they have enforced carbon emission reduction targets. Uh, universities across the UK, their central government funding is also linked to carbon emissions reduction. Um, so for a number of organizations, it's critical that they are uh, they're obliged to cut their carbon emissions. On top of that, there's also um, CRC uh, and uh, for those organizations, clearly um, switching to biomass can substantially reduce their, um, their costs under the CRC scheme. Other um, benefits, uh, obviously, as um, eco-funding like Green Deal and other uh, government packages come up, um, it can be important to demonstrate uh, that you're delivering a suite of, uh, of carbon emissions reduction uh, actions. Uh, and biomass can be a key way to unlock uh, eco-funding in the UK. And then finally, uh, future-proofing. Um, and there I've, I've put up a quote from DEC, which whilst I've hinted that natural gas may currently be uh, extremely competitive, um, DEC suggests that uh, by 2014 uh, or 2014 onwards um, that biomass will be the cheapest form of energy available in the UK. And that really isn't, in, isn't taking into account the RHI uh, which I'll come on to in a moment. But that's a really important point, clearly. Um, whilst in the past, uh, when uh, the economy was more buoyant, the soft benefits and carbon emissions reduction and um, benefits for ecosystems and local employment may have been of, of uh, uh, winning tickets to do with biomass. Now, a really key one is that it's about cutting um, costs annually to remain competitive. So moving on from that, just a little bit about what biomass is, really. Um, some fundamental, and, and it's always difficult not knowing uh, how, how knowledgeable an audience is on wood fuel, but um, just to state some of the key important points to bear in mind about what, what biomass is, is that, first of all, it's about heat, not electricity. As it currently stands, um, whilst there are on larger scale systems, you could do CHP, combined heat and power, um, the majority of biomass in the UK is about, um, or the majority of installations, is about heat-only delivery to buildings. Um, and I think um, progressively over time then, uh, and there are already a number of um, not particularly uh, efficient or, or kind of um, problem-solving solutions at the moment, but um, there are some solutions that generate electricity uh, from a biomass boiler, but only on an extremely small and uh, really insignificant scale. Um, the technology will come in time, but it's, it's several years away. Uh, in the 13 years involved, I've been involved in biomass, a number of people have been looking to try and achieve small-scale CHP, but it's, as yet uh, it's elusive. Um, CHP does work on a larger scale, but it's probably uh, at least um, uh, four or five megawatts of, uh, of heat 
uh, requirement upwards before the technology becomes um, viable. Second thing I really need to say is that um, this is an established technology. Um, I think um, whilst people may wait for the next generation of iPhone or computer, um, it's not the same with biomass boilers. Uh, the peak of efficiency, uh, which is up around um, probably a, a seasonal efficiency of about 85% and a uh, maximum operational efficiency of about 92%, which is the same as a uh, condensing gas boiler, um, was really achieved um, some decades back. Um, what we need to remember is that uh, the rest of Europe um, didn't have uh, fossil fuel or access to cheap fossil fuels in the form of North Sea oil and gas, uh, and they didn't have, uh, and they had predominantly socialist governments that tended to support renewable energy uh, substantially before it was supported in the UK economy. So this is a very advanced and established technology. There are boiler companies uh, in Austria, uh, France, Italy, um, uh, and Sweden and Finland that have been established businesses for 40, 45 years now and have supplied many tens of thousands of boilers over the life of the company. And that does give us one small advantage, which is that when importing this technology, we're importing something which is uh, already extremely advanced and developed uh, and, and does exactly what it says on the tin and, and delivers um, uh, very uh, competitive heat uh, and in the same, with the same efficiency and, um, uh, and reliability of uh, traditional fossil fuel boilers. Um, the next thing to come on to talk about is fuel uh, briefly. Um, it is uh, an often uh, posed question, which is where will our fuel come from and is it secure? Well, the first thing, of course, to remember is it's sustainable. So whilst we talk about um, uh, achieve, uh, uh, um, reaching a point of, um, uh, of finite oil supplies or finite gas supplies, um, of course, for wood fuel, uh, those can be uh, sustainably uh, replaced because they regrow. There is also an enormous amount of slack uh, still in the economy. There are 2 million acres of unmanaged forest resource in the UK, which could deliver about 4 million extra tons of biomass per annum. There is also still a significant volume of wood which goes to landfill each year. So uh, in, in uh, wondering the question, um, the answer to the question, uh, is the fuel supply secure and available? Uh, it certainly is, and, and there are uh, a range of suppliers across the UK delivering um, secure, robust fuel supply. Another big question people often ask themselves is chip or pellet. It's a long, long-standing debate. Um, both of them have their application. Um, it's, not, it's a long-standing but also a, a rather tiresome debate. Um, pellet has several advantages. It's a higher-density fuel. It is, um, therefore requires lower storage, storage space. The boilers and fuel feed mechanisms tend to be slightly lower cost, uh, and therefore it's an ideal fuel for smaller boilers, uh, and it's an ideal fuel for uh, urban areas or where space is extremely constrained. Uh, as soon as one gets into uh, larger boilers, perhaps 200 kilowatts plus, or, um, or where uh, there is substantial available space, uh, then CHIP becomes an ideal solution because it has a, a lower cost per kilowatt hour. So um, whilst CHIP suppliers or pellet suppliers or CHIP or, lo or pellet boiler suppliers may try and uh, lead people astray, uh, the reality is that um, both fuel types have their benefits and their applications in the UK. Uh, and both should be considered uh, depending on the, the scale and, uh, and space constraints of the project. Local depots, um, we as a company operate a number, uh, about 15 across the UK, but there are uh, really an increasing number of fuel suppliers supplying chip from uh, to particularly small radiuses, probably 30, 40 mile radius, and then um, pellet is being supplied over uh, a much larger radius because it tends to uh, come from larger plants that are uh, more capital intensive and, and with a larger output. But nevertheless, uh, a, an increasingly uh, robust and developed network of uh, chip and pellet suppliers across the UK. Um, scalability. So um, biomass really is applicable on, on any uh, heat application, anywhere from the smallest uh, wall-mounted boilers now can be, I think, even as low as 15 to 10, 15 kilowatts there on the slide, but actually uh, can be as low as about 7 kilowatts now which is a wall-mounted pellet boiler, suitable for uh, a flat is the kind of size uh, that that might be, domestic residential flat, uh, right up to 10 megawatts or 10 megawatts plus, uh, which would almost always be on chip, 
Um, so it's an extremely scalable uh, delivery uh, of heat. Uh, and But I think the important thing to bear in mind when considering different size projects is uh, that it's not simply about scaling up or scaling down um, fuel delivery or storage mechanisms. It's about getting the design and layout of the site absolutely right. And I think finally, um, the important thing is, as I mentioned before, is that it's this is um, a very comparable technology to fossil fuel boilers. Uh, I think in the early days when I started um, being involved in wood fuel, um, it had this kind of Casey Jones image that it was about shoveling chip or pellet in one end of the boiler and getting ash out the other end. Um, we're all sitting here today in a building which uh, is on the Trilisk network, and, um, and it, it has uh, efficient delivered heat, um, which uh, is... Uh, reliable and uh, and is not a, a belt and braces application. It's about modern automatic wood heating uh, for modern buildings and, and modern uses. And then finally, to come on to the renewable heat incentive. Um, as of um, about two years ago, the government started a, a really groundbreaking scheme called the Renewable Heat Incentive, um, designed to replace grants for boilers with um, a payment scheme which rewards you for carbon savings because the, uh, you are paid on, on the meter, essentially. So the more heat you use, the more your payment is. Um, and instead of you being paid simply to own a boiler, you're being paid to use it wisely. Um, so the scheme is tiered so that after you've used an, a certain amount of heat, the rate decreases, uh, and that obviously discourages you from using it excessively or, or wastefully. Uh, and it's about operating the boiler and burning uh, wood or, or uh, wood in the form of chip or pellets uh, to replace fossil fuels rather than, uh, than simply owning a boiler. It's about um, displacing fossil fuel usage. Uh, the scheme is extremely attractive. Um, uptake has, has really started to increase rapidly. Um, there are, the government do have the scope for applying degression and cutting rates. I think a really critical point to make is that uh, degression only applies to new entrants. Therefore, if you are already or are about to get on the Renewable Heat Incentive, the RHI, then once you commission your boiler and you're accepted onto the scheme by Ofgem, uh, then that's the rate you're on at, and that rate is for 20 years, and it's increased annually by RPI. If degression is applied to the rates, then it's only new entrants who, have, uh, who may uh, enter the scheme uh, at the rate uh, which is currently in force when they commission their boiler. So uh, it is not about... Uh, the government having the ability to uh, retrospectively cut rates, uh, that's simply not possible. These are fixed rates for a 20-year term, uh, and it's important that uh, DEC came up with a scheme like that in order to guarantee the level of investment required for, uh, for biomass schemes. So moving on from that, um, how do you do biomass heating uh, and systems? I think the first point to bear in mind is that these are complex. Um, these are not plug-and-play systems. Uh, they require careful design ensuring you understand the heat load of the buildings, size your boiler correctly, not oversized, not undersized, uh, that you size your accumulator tank correctly, which is a, uh, a um, large thermal store, uh, that you design your fuel storage and handling and vehicle access correctly. Um, and this is an entire system, and you also need to uh, incorporate the fact that you're, you may be delivering heat across an extensive um, heat main network to a number of other buildings. So careful design and consideration is really critical, and we certainly advise that people um, spend on early design. Um, I've, I've been involved in biomass for, for 13 years and seen many hundred projects, hundreds of projects across the UK, uh, and where projects are rushed into or design and planning advice isn't taken from people with experience and people with a track record, there are sadly um, mistakes being made even today. I imagined when I started being involved in biomass and started doing public speaking events and, and training for biomass, that I would one day be redundant. Sadly, as a company, we're still presented with fuel stores that, that are designed to take chip and maybe 15 cubic meters in volume, uh, in gross volume, which is a completely unrealistic delivery volume. It's a bit like having a, an oil tank at home, which is 50 liters. Um, you would pay a premium to have your fuel delivered to it, uh, and you would probably be be struggling to find suppliers who'd be prepared to deliver 50 cubic meters of, sorry, 50 liters of oil. So, um, sadly, systems do get badly designed uh, and badly installed. 
Um, uh, but it's very important not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, poor design is, is not a, a problem of biomass. It's a problem of the people who apply it sometimes. So taking advice is critical. Important to bear in mind, it's going to be both new builds and retrofit applications. Clearly, when the economy was in a different state, uh, a very large number of projects were on new builds, like the Building Schools for the Future program in the UK. And now, um, retrofit applications are a much larger part of the market. And I think <clears throat> what that's taught me is that um, because under retrofit circumstances, you are installing uh, without building new buildings, and therefore you're, you're very often modifying or adapting or using uh, existing locations for fuel storage and boilers, uh, these planning issues are even more, planning and design issues are even more important than, than with new build, because rather than being presented with a blank sheet of paper on which you can design, you've got to fit into uh, existing circumstances, which takes an even more uh, experienced level of, uh, uh, of design. So getting an early uh, and impartial experienced roadmap is really key uh, for any new project, the, the number one recommendation we would make. Uh, and in, by impartial, I mean not going to boiler installers, but we're going to people who uh, deliver biomass solutions and understand uh, the overarching um, issues of, a, a, of an entire system and its design. Just as you wouldn't go to um, a tire manufacturer to buy a car, uh, you, are, you go to a car manufacturer who's pulled all the component parts together. Uh, similarly, uh, a good successful biomass project will involve uh, finance, it will involve planning, uh, maybe planning consents, it will involve fuel storage design uh, and access and, and volumes, it will design, in, incorporate the boiler itself, uh, it will involve uh, M&E and downstream delivery of heat to buildings. So you can see there are a number of key elements there that you need to incorporate and you need to understand the links and effects between them. Financing options, a number of different options. People can self-finance, uh, or there are now increasingly ESCOs, which is an energy service company where um, businesses are prepared to uh, provide the capital to install the boiler and then operate it for a certain time period uh, and claim the RHI and deliver heat and sell heat to the customer. And slightly jumping ahead of myself there, I've said what I think makes a, a successful project, which is uh, understanding the overarching links between the different elements of, of a biomass install. Um, so I'm going to move on very rapidly because I know that um, uh, Mark and Stephen are uh, wanting to make their presentations. Just briefly, I'm going to talk about Forest Fuels, who we are and what we do. Um, we uh, are an established company. We uh, have been in the business for seven years now. We operate 15 depots across the UK uh, from three different offices. We have a, a substantial uh, and robust and established team uh, with between us many, many years experience in biomass. Um, we are, like, we, like it says in the company name, we're supplying fuel, so we're supplying chip and pellet to our customers, uh, about 35,000 tonnes of fuel, and all fuel is, is accredited so, and assured. So we're operating chip under the Woodshore scheme and pellet under EN+. We have uh, a range of customers from someone who may take one or two tonnes of pellets a year right up to uh, very substantial customers taking several thousand tons of chip uh, to large industrial uh, installations. Um, we have a, a robust network of supply, so we have um, we are able to guarantee the supply of our raw materials, uh, and we um, service a, a range of different customers from those uh, regional managers and, and regional depots, and a head office down in the southwest uh, with our uh, running the the main structure and backup of the business. So I show there we have a, a range of depots and our, our managers across the country. Uh, and then uh, really, besides simply being fuel supply, because we've developed a great range of expertise in-house, we provide um, a great deal of consultancy nowadays. And that might be site-specific, where we are uh, tendering projects for clients, designing them, doing the feasibility, uh, and also sometimes project managing as well, through to more general advice to larger organizations as to what their biomass policy might be across a, a range of properties or across, a, across the business. We do project management and fuel supply, and then we're also increasingly involved in financing solutions, so we provide an ESCO service where we install, where we design, we take the design and planning risk on the boiler, uh, and we install it and operate it as well. So the client has uh, both the finance and the design and operational risk taken away from them 
uh, and uh, they're simply buying delivered heat. The benefit for them is they get a, a reduction in their uh, energy cost. Uh, and just a, a few of the customers and partners we have across the UK, very wide ranging from um, government organizations to really an increasing number of, of private organizations now too. I'm going to move on now because um, we are uh, um, just about to hear from Mark Summers um, from Cornwall NHS. Um, so thank you very much. I'm going to speak very briefly at the end, but I shall hand over now to Mark. Oh, good afternoon. Um, my name is Mark Summers. I'm the Low Carbon Lead for Public Health Cornwall. Um, and the last project I worked on before I joined Public Health in 2009 was the biomass development at the Royal Cornwall Hospital at Trillisk in Truro, where I was um, in charge of uh, the low carbon program there. I'm actually going to take you back um, to a time when we were feeling our way um, feeling our way through you know, the development of this project uh, until we made contact with people like uh, Sam at Forest Fuels, which was about halfway through the development when we started to get you know, some answers to some of our um, more challenging questions, I suppose. So, first of all, could you give me the next... Um, yeah. uh, in fact, we'll go through two slides. Yeah, yeah that, that's fine. So, a bit of background. In 2008, the NHS measured its carbon footprint uh, as 21 million tonnes of CO2 per annum. And broadly, it related to 50% of what we bought, 24% related to the estate, so the lighting and heating, and 17% related to our travel. At that time, we also had a target of at least minus 80% to achieve by 2050, a target set via the Climate Change Act and by our own Sustainable Development Unit based in Cambridgeshire, who are now part of Public Health England. Trillisk Hospital is also in the CRC, so against that landscape, we were interested in carbon reduction. Next slide, please. So it was in the early noughties, I was approached by Truro Sawmills, who were interested in identifying a market for their slab wood waste. The proprietor had been on a number of fact-finding trips to Austria, looking at biomass technology, and was keen to link up. The first hurdle related to timing, and at that time, our gas price was low, too low to make biomass attractive. It was also pre carbon reduction commitment. However, it was obvious to me that this would change in time. We did start to consider biomass, and I was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to look at a number of systems in Austria as part of a fact-finding visit supported by the Cornwall Sustainable Energy Partnership. We went to an international wood pellet symposium. Yes, there's an international pellet conference. One lesson I was taught there was that although there were a large number of different boiler suppliers on the continent, I should really focus on three when making a technology choice. The ones with developed UK support networks, and I'm sure since then the number has increased, but, but support is a key issue. You don't want to be waiting weeks for spares with your system down. Another factor that was an issue for me at the time was the number of retrofit solutions i had been signposted to in the UK that for one reason or another were not running. I would stress that this is some time ago. Usually this was down to problems with automa automated fueling, either because the system had been designed from the boiler back, you need to start at the fuel end, or another reason was that critical aspects had been engineered out of the scheme to reduce capital costs. We decided to draw up a tender document for the provision of heat via biomass, and in the first attempt, we wanted to capitalise the scheme through the kilowatt hour price, a mini ESCO, something when we reviewed the submissions we could not have achieved for a number of reasons. One, capitalising the scheme via the kilowatt hour price at that time was not cost attractive. Secondly, not all the costs in the models presented i.e. some of the displacement costs, had not been factored in. For example, 
if a waste area on our site was displaced, it needed to be reprovided and any cost factored into the overall scheme. And that, didn't, uh, that wasn't the case. Effectively, we had tendered the opportunity, but the responses were partial solutions. We did not pursue that route further because of the heat supply price at that time was not sufficiently attractive for our finance teams to warrant um, trying to resolve some of the other issues. There was also the risk. When evaluating the options, you look at what's working, and from a hospital perspective, the schemes that I'd been signposted to by NHS estates were not operational, and this was broadly due to the poor fit between the fuel supply system and the boiler. Where this was a problem, and it was on a number of the early systems, the maintenance became such an issue the systems were simply switched off. I relayed this back to the NHS estates team in Leeds and suggested they visit Cornwall to look at what we had done and give advice on what they thought should be the next stage. I continued to look at different systems that were up and running to a greater and lesser extent in the area, systems that used a range of different wood fueling options, and it became clear to me that this was key and fundamentally, this, the fuels type was key and fundamentally influenced the design cost and subsequent management of the system. So an early lesson for me was to start with the fuel, the fuel type and supply and work forward. This is fundamental as is making sure the scheme is sufficiently capitalized and the advice I would give is automate as much of the functionality as you can, particularly on retrofit. We were still thinking about the opportunity and whether to explore very cheap fuel options. I mean, if you look at the, the um, slide material, we might have been given um, things like uh, material we would have been given, such as the slash, slash and um, a, a boral arisings and other miscellaneous chip material, the kind of things you see on the roadside almost every day, which in effect would require us to become our own fuel broker or to look at it on a more formalized purchase arrangement for a specified chip or a pellet, um, or the ability to use both chip and pellet. Um, at that time, we ruled out the roundwood option due to noise and dust constraints. After consideration, we didn't have the capacity, resources, or desire to become a wood chip fuel broker, so our only real options would be pellet or chip. Back. Sorry. Yeah. NHS States made their visit and suggested we made an application to the NHS £100 million Carbon Reduction Capital Fund, which had just been announced. This we did, and we were awarded £750,000 for the project, roughly right for a 750 kilowatt project, um, as outline costs were indicated to us as being 1,000 pounds per kilowatt of installed capacity. With the finance confirmed, we tendered for consultants to manage the project, and this was won by Hall Lee. The project size was dictated by our base load. Initially, we'd had have bigger aspirations but the consultants advised us to target 750 kilowatts. This was really good advice. So with Hawley on board, we established a regular schedule of meetings, identified we would need to develop the project in a number of stages, which would involve a fuel supplier, construction phase, as well as M&E teams, and that the project would need to be tendered in accordance with EU procurement regulations. We had identified a space. Fortunately, we had an area that had previously accommodated a waste incinerator with a suitable foundation. I think without this very solid uh, ground foundation, the civil engineering costs would have escalated significantly. It was located next to the existing boiler house, so ideal for tapping into the existing system. 
The design had to accommodate stringent dust control as the unit was close enough to respiratory wards to be a potential problem. One complaint from a hospital consultant could derail the project. The only space available was in a busy area of the hospital, so access and traffic volume was also an issue. This led to a more expensive solution, but one that involved one lorry movement per day, which could be undertaken outside working hours. The solution involved a hook bin and a container with a powered walking floor, something that also dictated the fuel, which would be wood chip with a size specification. A fuel supplier helped design the internal fuel bin to which the hook bin connected. This meant the system could continue to run whilst the hook bins were exchanged. The boiler supplier selected through the tendering process was Froling, one of the three makes identified to me on my visit to Austria. This was integrated into a system of accumulators and controls that would sit between the biomass and other gas-fired boilers feeding the hospital network. Heat metering was an important component, something we wanted to be part of an ongoing fuel supply contract. At the time, we had no idea of what the maintenance requirements were going to be. This was a concern and one, one I was unable to quantify and address in the development phase. So I decided to go at risk and see how this aspect panned out. Next slide. So in March 2009, with the construction phase completed, we were ready to commission. We had capitalized the project with an NHS grant worked with Hall Lee in the construction phase, and at the point of commissioning, it became apparent that the in integral chimney was not high enough, something which caused an evacuation and fire brigade visit on the first lighting. Basically, we, we, we were now on an imposed shutdown whilst we resolved this issue, and my colleague will go into this in more detail in a minute. But before I hand over to him, I'd like to just talk about the fuel contract. This we tendered, and the detail of which is commercial in confidence. However, the key points are that we wanted the cost to be related to the energy content of the fuel, not just the volume, something we could monitor via the heat meter. We wanted a long-term contract, and we wanted a price fix. We were interested in the effect on the local economy. One of the biggest benefits in my book was paying local businesses a significant volume a resource rather than a faceless gas company. We wanted to develop a supplier-customer relationship, an open book approach. And finally, as a hospital decision maker, I had to look at the security of supply, which was why we selected a wood fuel brokerage over a sawmill business. However, we were very careful to make sure that the feedstock included material from local sawmills. I'd like now to just uh, to introduce Stephen Carter, who will take you through the next stage of the story. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Stephen Carter. I'm uh, an estates officer here at the Royal Commons Hospital Trust. I've been here in post since uh, 2008, and I actually joined the trust um, at the concept stage of this project. Um, and uh, saw the project right through to its completion, and um, I now run and maintain the boiler as well. Um, so the Royal Cornwall Hospital Trust is, a, is an acute hospital trust in Cornwall. We have uh, three acute hospitals across the county. And the Royal Cornwall Hospital is the biggest of the three, and it's the main um, acute hospital for the county of Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly. Um, as Mark explained, the, um, the biomass boiler was, was funded by um, a government renewables grant for, of uh, £600,000. Um, and uh, it was sized um, to, to meet the hospital's base load um, of heat demand. And at the time, that was uh, approximately 750 to 800 kilowatts in the summer and the winter peaking to a megawatt. Um, so that the boiler was sized to 750 kilowatts. Um, 
in a few slides time you'll see some photos of it and um, understand hopefully that um, the, the, the constraints we had on space availability um, also restricted our size as it was a retrofit project. Um, the, the retrofit, it's, it was retrofitted into a system with, four, uh, with three 1.4 megawatt Saki burner boilers. Um, they're dual fuel, so um, under the HCM uh, requirements, we have to have dual fuel, and the uh, biomass is a third, third fuel as well. So we, we actually have three, three types of fuel on site. Um, the seasonal variation of our peak load um, also depends on our patient, patient throughput as well. In the summer, we, we do experience high patient throughput in, on a nice summer with a, being a holiday destination. And also in the winter with an, with an aging population in Cornwall, we can see quite high peak loads as well. Um, next slide, please. So the, the biomass boiler that was installed is a Froling 750 kilowatt boiler. It's been sized to meet the base load of the hospital, as I explained. Um, and also to assist this, it's got two 5,000 uh, 5, litre accumulators. They act as a thermal store, as Sam explained earlier. And uh, they're, they're the main buffer between the, the biomass system and the, the dual fuel boil boilers in the, in the room next door. Um, we operate with a G50 wood chip. And uh, as Sam explained earlier, that's, uh, there's quite uh, a lot of guidance and um, industry standards for a G50 spec wood chip now. Um, and also, as explained, we, we're on a 15-year supply contract now with Forest Fuels as well. We're, we're way into that now, so we've got quite good experience of that. Um, and also, as Sam explained, the biomass system is a system, not just a boiler. So I'd like this slide indicates quite nicely um, the, the key elements of this system. Um, each part is as important as the, as the next, really. We, if you break one of these links, then the system starts falling down. Um, you also have to remember you have ash and flue gas as a byproduct, so there has to be a stream for this to go to as well. Um, here at the Royal Cornwall Hospital, we, we're quite lucky in that we have farmers just down the road. Um, our ash waste is, uh, is taken by a local farmer, and he puts it on his land for, for growing arable crops. Um, and uh, the flue gas... Um, as Mark explained earlier, with the short chimney that was installed originally on the boiler, it became quite a problem. Um, we had quite a lot of smoke issues on site, and as, as Mark explained, we had a, quite a, a major flaw in the design there uh, with the fire brigade coming to site. Since then, um, a retrofit um, aftermarket uh, solution was fitted to the boiler. It's not the best design in the world, but given the space constraints that we have, it's, it suits, suits the purpose. Um, it could be better, is, is what I'd say on that, to be honest, that from experience. Uh, the next slide shows the, the boiler itself. So, as you can see, well, I hopefully see from the, the picture on the right-hand side of the boiler, it's very close to the wall of the, the plant room. Um, it's equally as close on the back end of the boiler as well, so we're, we're really tight. It's, it's squeezed quite well in there. Um, maintenance is, is a bit of constrained, shall we say, but it's still achievable, so um, that's why we went for the 750 kilowatt size. Um, the next slide is uh, just a picture of the accumulator, so that's what that looks like. We've got two of those right next to each other, and as I explained, they're, they're the heater batteries, so that, that's but the, the boilers heat in those, and then we, we extract the heat from those accumulators straight into our heat, uh, district heating network. The next slide shows our, uh, one of our wood, uh, wood chip hook bins. We have two of them. They were purchased as uh, part of the project. Um, both of them have a walk-in floor, and um, I'll explain in, in a few slides time some issues that we've had with these um, from experience but they've all been overcome so they're not uh, the end of the project by any means um, these hook bins hold about seven tons of wood chip um, and on the back end is an auger which which delivers this wood chip into the internal store so given that is the next slide i should go into detail that the wood store 
holds approximately a quarter of the, of the, the hook bin's load. And this lasts, in, in the winter, it lasts about six hours. So we have, we have uh, any one time with a full wood store, we've got about six hours stored capacity if the bin outside is empty. Um, that's quite good. In the, we, uh, we've got good working relationship with forest fuels and can usually get a, a hook bin to site within that time frame. Um, we have four deliveries of wood chip a week, um, and we've we synchronise that to the with the boiler light up. So um, it's quite critical lessons learned from from running this sort of boiler. Um, if you start it on a Monday and run out of wood on a Tuesday afternoon, you need a delivery to be scheduled for Tuesday afternoon. So. Um, understanding how how it's going to work and when you when you light the boiler, how lo how much fuel you have to last in your stores is quite key to to keeping the thing going. Um, next is the chimney. Now this chimney is a uh, the old chimney that was always on site. The, the three gas boilers link into this chimney. Um, originally the flue, the original flue for the biomass uh, was in the um, bracket that you can see just above to the right hand side of that chimney uh, and it, it terminated just at the top of the building height um, as we've explained uh, this this wasn't big enough or high enough so um, the existing flue then you can see coming out the wall it then goes on a horizontal uh, run to, to meet that main chimney uh, that main chimney is about 80 meters high I think something like that and it's um, it's there's good good draw on it, but we still find issues in in the wood chip. Uh, the um, the smoke does cool by the time it gets to the top of it, um, so that's the main problem with that chimney. Um, something that could be overcome quite easily, I think, given a bit more capital investment. Uh, that's just a picture of the the furnace of the boiler uh, when it was lit. Um, it, the design of the boilers uh, of the furnace is, is such that it's got a, an arched roof which channels the heat towards the water chamber which is situated above um, and uh, it's got a hot gas bypass as well so that, that you don't get fire over the, the water tube so um, it's the same works the same way as any conventional um, gas or oil boiler um, Running and maintaining this boiler, I've learned that, I've, I've estimated it's, it's about 1% um, ash from the boiler. So what you put into the boiler, you get about 1% worth of ash out the back of the boiler um, after a clean burn. Um, this is another way of telling if the boiler is running efficient, efficiently or not. If you're getting um, a lot of clinker and um, byproducts or unburnt wood through through your ash. Um, containers, then uh, there's telltale signs there that something's not quite right. Um, next is the integration between the biomass boiler and our main hospital heating system. Um, here is, is the installation. You can see the two system pumps. They're on a duty standby um, and they're inverter driven. The heat meter just to the right of that um, is how we how we are built basically for our for our um, wood chip or heat heat consumption, and the the, the boiler output temperature sensor, which is on the on the delivery side of the pumps. So some key issues now. Um, I think we've explained this before, but um, I will just emphasise the point that um, the fuel store, the space constraints. Um, and size of the fuel store is, is key to the project being a, being a success. Um, in order to um, to run with a, 50, a G50 um, wood chip, which is 50% moisture, um, the ventilation in this store is quite key. Otherwise, it starts raining inside the store. It does sweat quite quite badly um, if it's stored for extended periods. Um, Six hours of turnover is usually quite good, but if it, if you do lay dormant for a week or so for maintenance and things like that, we have had issues of of the wood chip um, causing condensation. So putting a bit of ventilation in there does help. Um, the dust 
can be an issue, as we've explained, the, the boiler installation is quite close to respiratory wards, which are sensitive to airborne particulate. So we're quite heavy, uh, quite heavy on our uh, constraints with the dust. Um, that's the main reason for having the hook bin delivery system. And also inside the building, we're quite um, constrained on the dust control as well. So um, it's key to having a lid on your um, on your internal store if that is an issue. Um, also, as I explained, from dust point of view, is, is the proximity to the building, local buildings. You've got to know who's around you and and any um, worries that they may have. Um, security of supply, um, both for maintenance and for um, delivery of the wood chip. That's quite key. Um, regular inspections of the fuel store, just checking the wood chip through, checking you're not getting anything you shouldn't be getting in your wood wood supply, and also that the internal store itself is in um, in good good. Um, state of repair. Um, let's move on to understanding the boiler. Um, key parts of the boiler, the, uh, the moving parts, the, uh, we have a moving grate that, that's quite key to the operation of the boiler that, that moves the wood chip down, down its um, furnace. Um, wood chip boilers are quite slow to respond, they're not like a gas boiler, they don't, they don't modulate very well. Um, so we we have to understand that when we're integrating it into systems. Um, there's lots of sensors and um, uh, many things which can cause the boiler to to turn itself off or safety devices that will turn the boiler off. So we have to understand how they work and they're key for running a boiler from day to day. You have to understand why it, why it's doing what it's doing. I think we're going to go to um, questions and answers because we're running out of time, I'm afraid. So um, sorry about that. And I think these presentations are available afterwards. So sorry to cut you short there, Stephen, um, because I see there's a number of questions people have answered, have asked rather. Um, just really to wrap up the presentations, um, three lessons. If you learn nothing else from today, we'd hope you learn to get advice uh, at the earliest possible stages, emphasized by both Mark and Stephen. Uh, getting the design and planning of the system right is critical. Second thing I hope you learned today is that resolving technical and financial questions early on are critical. Where am I going to put my boiler? Uh, what size is it going to be? How is my fuel storage going to be designed and, and delivered? Uh, and can I afford it? And what are, what are the numbers? How big is my boiler going to be? What's it going to cost? And in fact, I see I'm answering one of the questions already here. Someone said, is there, a, is there an argument for uh, moving to biomass sooner rather than later? The answer is, uh, as I've said on the slide, crack on, do it now. The RHI is at its highest rate now uh, and will only fall as the number of new applicants come online. Uh, there is a limited budget for the RHI scheme of about $850 million, uh, and as that gets used up, the rates are choked off in order to try and reduce demand. So the answer is, should you do it sooner rather than later, the answer is absolutely yes. Um, so now I'm going to move on to try to answer some of the questions which have come up on, on the screen here for me. Um, someone asked, can you switch between fuel types? Um, and the answer to that very simply is that um, a chip boiler will take uh, pellet fuel, will take both chip and pellet fuel, but a pellet boiler will only take pellets. So if you're thinking about future proofing, then the answer is that a, a pellet boiler gives you greater flexibility for the future. Um, moving down through the questions, um, how do you go about assessing the guarantee of supply? Um, perhaps um, Stephen and Mark might want to um, make some comment on that. Um, but certainly we've done um, empirical studies for people assessing uh, the volume of available feedstock within a 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 mile radius of the site. So we've done this for, uh, for a number of um, military installations in the UK where they were very keen on, on uh, local supply. Um, so uh, there are a number of ways it can be done, but uh, and so you can prove that the available feedstock is out there. But I don't know, Mark or Stephen, do you have any comments on guaranteeing supply? Or? Um, just going back to my ex my experience, which was um, I, 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 I um, referred to it in the presentation as going with a brokerage that's taking fuel from a number of different sources, rather than um, tying yourself to a single business. Single businesses at the mercy of uh, uh, I mean, if 
for example, you tie yourself to a sawmill, um, the sawmill, and, and something happens to the sawmill, what happens to your fuel supply? Uh, so, you know, it's a common sense approach, really. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and I think that's, um, you know, there are people who have thought, well, it's an obvious connection. I've got a sawmill down the road and they, they buy from there. And then the sawmill either reduces its business throughput uh, and suddenly the fuel supply isn't there or there was a sawmill that caught fire. Um, there are other issues. So it is um, highly risky. The advantage of a, uh, of a fuel supplier with multiple uh, depots is that they can uh, move material between depots as and when required if there are uh, variations in demand across the country. Uh, I'm just going to answer a question someone's raised about uh, wet wood chips. Someone said, is it worth um, using heat from the boiler to dry the chip before it goes into the boiler itself? Um, this is a very tricky one to sort of try to, try to explain, really. Um, obviously, if you do that, you are using heat to try to dry material and increase the heat availability in the fuel you've just dried, which you then burn. But in fact, because you're moving between different uh, uh, you're moving from heat to potential energy in the chip, uh, you actually have some losses in that process. So uh, it isn't really that efficient. Um, and whilst it may seem counterintuitive to a lot of people, the idea of a, a boiler burning wet wood chip, uh, they are designed to do that. So boilers can take up to 50, 55, even 60 percent moisture content fuel. Uh, and it, it's not like a, an open fire where uh, you're not forcing air into the fire, uh, and you're not controlling the burn and the rate of fuel delivery and the rate of oxygen input. So an open fire, if you burn wet fuel, you get very incomplete combustion, you get tarring in the chimney. Uh, it's really not like that inside a modern biomass boiler. You're forcing air in with a primary, secondary, maybe even tertiary air supply, which is forced in uh, through fans, uh, and you have a very, very complete burn. If you're going to think of a, a, a biomass boiler, you should think of something more akin to a um, to a modern uh, log uh, burner in a house where they have a number of systems called air wash systems where they're essentially recirculating the flue gases. So they're a very clean burn. Uh, and where you do that, you really don't have an issue with uh, moisture content. Um, counterintuitive it may seem, but even high moisture content uh, boilers are extremely efficient uh, and achieve the, roughly the same levels of efficiency as dry fuel systems. So the idea of drying fuel simply to uh, release more energy inside the boiler uh, is is actually probably a net loss in energy if you were to do uh, an inventory of uh, of the heat and how you use it during that process. Um, so uh, I'm just reading questions here. Um, I just add into that that the um, you know the reason for using a heat meter is you can take some um, gauge on the energy content of the fuel as it hits your uh, you know, it hits your system. So if you get a particularly wet batch, yeah. uh, you can adjust the amount you pay accordingly. Yeah. Yes, that's one of the, the benefits of the contract we have here at Trilisk is that it's it's a heat supply contract rather than so instead of the hospital buying um, chip off us, they're buying delivered heat off us. So if we deliver in fuel which is wetter or lower density, then um, uh, then the rate the hospital pays doesn't change at all. Um, they're still paying on the amount of heat they use. So wetter fuel will deliver less heat per cubic meter, uh, and therefore uh, it doesn't affect the, um, the customer's cost for their, for their delivered heat. Um, the point that was raised in the question is that if there is redundant heat, uh, then it may be useful to use it for drying. Um, and then coming to a final question here, uh, is there any security of maintaining the increase of demand on the delivery of the main supply of wood stocks are enough to supply the increase? I think it's a question really about... Um, about is there a, a guaranteed supply of fuel? I think we do have to ask the question, which is that will energy production and demand uh, start meaning that people start growing energy crops on uh, on land that may be more appropriate for food production? And that is a, a controversial one, not one I really would aim to an answer here. Um, as someone said, uh, someone far more intelligent than me said on Radio 4 the other day, uh, ultimately uh, society has to choose between food and energy and that crunch may be coming sooner rather than later. And then a final question is, um, someone asked about um, grant funding towards uh, a wood store for biomass installation. Uh, there may be some funding available. There was some funding from the RDPE, um, Rural Development Programme for England, for large-scale um, fuel storage, um, but uh, not for the individual store itself. As I say, the renewable heat incentive has replaced uh, grant systems with 
uh, payments for uh, energy consumption. Um, um, that's really it. I think we're going to have to wrap up there. It's um, 3.01, so um, uh, hoping uh, people have got their questions answered. Um, I think the presentations and contact details for all three of us are available, so be very happy to answer questions or, or inquiries outside of this format um, at a later date. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yep. Great. Thank you, Sam. So, yep, unfortunately, that's all we've got time for for now. But um, I'd like to thank Sam, Mark and Stephen for their time today and for getting through so many questions. And also for everyone who's in joined us for this webinar. Just to remind you, a recording of the webinar and the presentation size will be archived on the Two Degrees platform. So I hope you found today interesting and useful and you'll be able to join us for future webinars. Thank you.